No matter what uh, your size, if you intend to grow your business into more than just uh, a lifestyle workplace, not that there's anything wrong with that, uh, you should, of course, create a board of directors. The establishment of a proactive board is perhaps the uh, first step towards professionalizing your company uh, and its management. An effective board should help control risk develop strategy and provide resources that will pay back in better overall management of the company and more efficient use of its resources. That's the idea anyway. More importantly, no entrepreneur or CEO can do it all alone, uh, especially in a rapid growth scenario. A board can act as a sounding board for those big decisions, open doors perhaps, and uh, support the business plans. In this next session, in this panel debate, uh, we're going to discuss how, through the right non-executive director, you can get the best out of your board. And I'm delighted to welcome our panelists to this next session. Uh, Sherry Kutu OPE is uh, a distinguished serial entrepreneur and angel investor who serves on uh, a number of boards of companies, charities and university. Difficult to see how there's any more time in the week, really. Uh, alongside her, uh, we have uh, Kate Bash. Uh, Kate is uh, a blue chip uh, FMCG marketeer and uh, founder of the award-winning brand Health and Her, which uh, specializes in women's health, specifically targeting the menopause market. Uh, and also a great pleasure to welcome uh, Wayne Harvey, uh, an experienced and active NED with uh, a background in finance. Uh, Wayne is currently the non-exec chair of Cardiff Airport and non-exec director of Family Finance Group. And a very great pleasure to uh, have joining me in the studio, Alison Thorne, who has retail experience uh, having been uh, an executive director with uh, Otto UK, uh, George at Asda, uh, Mothercare, uh, plus on the uh, operating board of uh, B&Q. Uh, she's currently chair of uh, Quarateg, uh, board member of uh, Sports Wales, Cardiff Metropolitan University, uh, and a panel member for uh, public appointments uh, in Welsh Government. So a wonderful panel to introduce you to. Uh, welcome to uh, all of you. And don't forget that uh, if you're watching this thinking, I'd like to chip in uh, and, uh, and get a question in here, it's the usual format, and we will do our very best, as we've been doing throughout the course of the morning, to get your thoughts uh, onto, uh, onto the show. Let's start, um, if we may, on the, the role of the NED. There's lots of people watching today for whom this is new territory, and that's absolutely fine. This is what this is, this is absolutely for. Um, so not all businesses will know uh, a lot about non-executive directors uh, necessarily. So Wayne Harvey, let's start with you first of all. And for those of us uh, who are not familiar with uh, NEDs, what is the key role uh, of an NED uh, or chair on a board? Have we got... Oh, Wayne, you may be muted. I think we may have... Sorry. There you are. Splendid. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, schoolboy Aaron. Number one. First of all, good morning, everyone. And... Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel. Thank you, Jamie, for the uh, for the opening question. I, I think I'll start by saying <clears throat> what it's not. It's not getting involved in the day to day management of the business, but it's more around a creative contribution to the board, providing some insight and some wider perspectives um, and also a constructive challenge. I think many NEDs um, really do add value by asking the question, what are we doing here? hang on a minute, let's just think this through. Um, and actually, that, that that isn't the sole role of an NED, but it, it is a very, very important part. So there's a focus on policy making, there's a focus on strategy. And also, the NED must remember that they're acting in the interests of stakeholders, uh, which is a wider group than just shareholders. But a good NED will add that constructive challenge, add some experience uh, and some wise counsel, and we'll also add a different perspective because very often, particularly with with entrepreneurs um, who are very dynamic, very enthusiastic, very progressive and are driving their business forward, just sometimes they may not know the answer to everything, although they think they do. And so an NED can actually 
add a little bit of a check and a balance there and provide some perspective. And a wider role clearly is once um, investment's been generated in, into the business, it can provide confidence and a bit of reassurance to shareholders. So, so those those would be my 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 key points for an NED. And for those of you who are thinking about an NED or weren't thinking about it but are now thinking about it, um, an, an NED really really can add value, and um, uh, the right NED will really help you drive your business forward. Okay, thank you. That's a, a useful start. Uh, and following on from it, uh, I guess, um, what's the difference between uh, Alison uh, executive and non-executive members of the board? Thanks, Jamie. I think building on what Wayne has said is that um, the executives are about running the business and the non-execs are about scrutiny of um, with its conforming to all of the legal uh, requirements, but also about performance, so helping the, the executives with strategy and monitoring that performance against strategy. And it's really important for both the exec and the non-execs to be very clear about those differences right from the very beginning. Um, and that's where governance will come in around uh, delegation of duties in terms of reference. Um, many of the ways I would describe it and building something on what Wayne was saying really is that the non-exec is your critical friend. So they're there to help and criticise some elements, but they're really there to be a friend and support. And what I've learned over time is you have to put your nose in, but keep your hands out. <laughs> okay, well, we might come back to that. I, I, I want to talk about NED impact and value, uh, if I may. Uh, and perhaps uh, this moves us on to uh, uh, an often difficult question uh, business owners ask. Uh, why do businesses need NEDs? Uh, what value uh, can they bring? Um, so let's get some NED perspectives on this first. Sherry, let's begin with you. Can you handle those? I can try. Uh, just checking the microphone, you can hear me? We can, yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, my first time when I was a NED goes back about 20 years ago. Um, when alongside being CEO of my own company, which was at the time small, um, I became a NED at a large FTSE 250 company. And I was amazed at the role of NEDs on the, on the larger company. And it completely changed how I treated my NEDs on my company. And I realized that I hadn't been using them well, and I hadn't been equipping them to actually be team members. And I, you know, and I hadn't thought of them as team. I'd only thought of them as governance before. Uh, and by team, I wasn't giving them proper information to allow them to make decisions. I sometimes gave it to them the night before and expected them to add value, you know, even though they hadn't had time to, to prep. Um, and the change from not using NEDs well to starting to use them well because I had become an NED myself was the difference between night and day. And they helped me uh, figure out problems that were in my head as a CEO that I didn't know who, who else to turn to. Uh, I, again, both have just mentioned critical, critical friends. They were critical friends. I think the prime difference between an NED or someone you can hire who's a consultant or an advisor is the difference between a transaction, a project that's a, a fit period of time, and, uh, and transformational because they, the average NED is with you for nine years. So you don't sign up to help you do a transaction. You sign up for nine years. It's usually three bunches of uh, three years. Um, but that longevity means that you get into issues, uh, the issues that you're not dealing with because they're really hard. I think the, any, the NEDs helped me keep those on that agenda and between meetings helped me sort them out, sometimes with their expertise, sometimes with their Rolodexes, uh, and sometimes just sitting down over a coffee and teasing out the, you know, the decision tree and what you were looking at, because sometimes we ran into things that I'd never encountered before, and I needed you know, people who weren't there to earn a buck from me, uh, but who really wanted the, you know, the, the purpose of the company to be successful for, for the customers. And they made the they made it with all of the difference to me, but I was using them badly first. Uh, so I would, again, I, I was really excited when you asked me on this because as somebody who 
started out not really knowing what they were for, but thinking I should have them, uh, to now relishing and really welcoming their input is, is incredible. I, I'll just finish and pass on to the others. The one thing that I like now is I recruit other NEDs, either to companies that I'm an executive in or, or NED in, is thinking, why are they there? What in particular can they add? And sometimes it's a different mindset. I have, I'm a hopeless optimist, and I always see the glass full to overflowing, and I actively try to find people who see glasses bone dry. Uh, and that's a really good compliment and part of that team, and it's a mindset differential Although I know that later we we might come to talk about diversity of gender or uh, or ethnicity as well, but mindset and perspective and expertise is is really important or was was for me, so I could ask those hard questions that were literally keeping me up at night because they were swirling around in my mind. They stopped swirling around with a proper board because you could uh, you could wrestle them down to the ground. Well, hold those thoughts because it's it's brutally honest and, and fascinating. We're going to drill down into uh, that further uh, in just a few minutes. But I just want to come to Wayne briefly and and just pick up on 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 on, on the central question about why businesses need NEDs and and, and what value uh, can they bring and, and and your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. I. I really believe that NEDs can add huge value because they stand away from the day to day. And that's the, the key point for me. I mean, occasionally in a crisis situation, NEDs will get involved in day to day matters. And I'm sure there would have been examples over the last 18 months where because of the pandemic, m many businesses will have called on the support of their NEDs. But ordinarily, an NED steps away from the day to day and becomes, in effect, the conscience for the board. And I, I, I feel that that adds huge value, whether you're a, a relatively small business that's in possibly even in, in startup or scale up mode, or you're a very substantial business um, or, or possibly even a listed business. The NED can act as a sounding board, particularly for the CEO, but also for other exec members and other NEDs if you have more than one on the board. They can act as a conscience. They can ask those difficult questions. And they can also try and instill some uh, some candor and respect and trust. And um, that isn't to say that boards that don't have NEDs don't have respect, trust and candor, but an NED can add just that little bit extra there and um, provide an environment where hopefully the company can get to a, a better position and can develop. And also NEDs add huge value, given that the majority of them are very experienced in terms of developing the executives on the board. So acting as a mentor, and as we said earlier, as a critical friend. Let's get the, the business owner's perspective uh, on this. Um, Health and Her has been an extraordinary story, uh, Kate Bash. Um, I, I mean, I wonder if you would just share with us, if you would, um, the value that uh, non-executive directors uh, have brought to you. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, huge value. Um, I think one of the biggest things that we get uh, is perspective, which as a kind of quite a lonely role being a CEO trying to drive a company forward, you often miss kind of what your peers are doing and what success looks like. And um, and I think, you know, NEDs can bring that experience, so their prior experience of being an entrepreneur, but they also quite regularly are NEDs on many, in many other companies and can bring uh, some of the experience that they're seeing or, or some of the perspective that they see across other businesses, which is invaluable really to us. Um, I think the other, the other kind of areas, I think we've already covered most of them, but I think one of the really interesting areas is confidence for investors and, and potentially also debtors. Um, I think new investors are often asking about who you have as a team around you, and I think having some really strong NEDs really help with that that kind of critical point of, of new value. So I think that's another area to think about, especially for kind of startups and scale-ups. And I think on a personal level for me, I think the one thing I've really enjoyed that I get from NEDs is, is a bit of a cheerleader approach. So I think sometimes, yes, it, you absolutely have to answer some difficult questions. You know, they're, they're very good at looking at the bigger picture it, equally, they're able to really motivate you and excite you about what you're achieving, again, coming back to that perspective. So I think 
on so many levels, um, it's such an important um, role uh, the, uh, on the board and, and to have that team of expertise around you. Thank you for that. And we, we will come back and, and pick through some of those points that you've raised uh, in just a few moments. Alison, I just want to bring you in here because we, we've touched around this in other sessions uh, earlier on today. Um, board governance. Um, why is it so important? Um, I think when we heard from other panellists as well is around that importance of understanding what this relationship is from the beginning. And governance is really the wraparound around how the organisation is going to frame itself. And there are um, sectors that are, are you know, highly regulated. Um, and so you need to have the governance framework in place to ensure that you can apply with any um, regulations and or legislation that's in place. Um, so it's really giving you the security as an owner or as a board that everything is in place um, for you to be able to operate effectively. It takes a bit of time um, and it's really worth putting that time in at the beginning um, of the shaping of the organisation, but recognising that there's an agility. And so how you might frame your board and then committees today may be different to how you would do it in three years, but then you've got terms of reference you can keep going back to for your committee and your board to say, OK, where's the landscape changing? What do we need to do more of or less of? And just by having those components and asking yourself those questions on a frequent basis, you will manage your business much more effectively. I'm sure lots of people watching will think you need to talk about recruitment and um, perhaps you want to become a non-executive director, what, perhaps you want to hire them. Uh, many businesses might want to uh, establish a board uh, but perhaps won't know exactly uh, where to start. Where can companies find uh, non-executive directors? Where can companies find a chair? Um, Kate, let's start on this with you. How do you go about pulling a board together? Will you share your experiences of this? Yes, of course. I mean, I think, you know, in the first kind of early stages of the business, it tended to be quite organic through network and business coaches that were already kind of with me on, on the journey of, of creating Health and Her. But I think in, in more recent times, as we've scaled, we've done, uh, we've gone through exercises looking at the total business uh, strengths, where we believe that there are opportunities to um, strengthen particular areas of expertise. Uh, for us, um, we we are very good, I think, as a as a kind of management team to identify where we have our weaknesses, and I think it's it's one of one of the things we really pride ourselves on. But it's so important to to kind of admit that and and know where you need to pull in that expertise. And with um, with NEDs, obviously you can do that through your through your employees as well. But with NEDs, I think it's also incredibly important to bolster uh, the, those particular areas that you know you want to grow into for example um so ultimately we we have uh, done done a lot of the recruiting kind of through our network and rightly or wrongly also through our investors um so we and and our last uh, kind of appointments we made three appointments earlier on this year they were we had a number of candidates that were kind of interested through our network um and again we use this process of of actually scoring each individual on, on a basis of where we felt they could add uh, the most significant value. I think the final thing really that we always consider is around fit. So I think the business has a certain culture and a certain kind of ethical standpoint. And we really wanted to make sure that that kind of fit was correct as well. And it's really interesting hearing Sherry earlier mention about having those those slightly different personalities that, you know, that that is also really important. But I think um, you know, we've we've had the pleasure of working with most of the NEDs that we now have on the board um, uh, in in prior um, relationships, and I think knowing that you get that 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 really good relationship and knowing that you can get that value um, is also incredibly important. Um, yeah, so that's that's mostly that's the that's most of our journey so far. I'm sure it will um, I'm sure it will expand again. <laughs> you make it sound almost like putting a football team together, where you you clearly have specific needs for specific people. I mean, it's it's a, it's such a creative process, isn't it? Absolutely, and it, it is it is incredibly important. I think you know as important as really hiring hiring the team around you and recognizing that as an entrepreneur, you definitely cannot do everything. Um, and I think as you scale, it just becomes more and more important to, to recognize that and understand that, you know, delegation, both kind of 
um, sideways and down is is incredibly important to to manage um, your own mental health as well as well as obviously growing the business. I just I just want to ask you something about um, the sort of demographic of of of, of your board and um, whether or not you're almost seeking those older, wiser heads, or, or whether you think, well, actually, what we need is some much younger blood here. I mean, how, how do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think, um, it, interestingly for our business, again, it comes back to where we're looking for expertise. I think we, we operate hugely in tech, which tends to mean that the age demographic is, is a bit younger. Um, I think what's a really a funny uh, kind of story, really, is we... we Prior to that, our last investment round, we were an entire board of females, which is possibly a, like, <laughs> a very unusual situation. So we actively looked for male NEDs this time around to really balance that gender diversity on our board. Um, so we, we are now 50-50, which I, I know is a, an unusual um, kind of direction to come from. Um, I think that's also important. So we, we actually have great diversity across the board, both, both gender and age. Um, but absolutely, we we have a, a really nice mix of, of that great experience, both from um, people that have been there and been entrepreneurs themselves to, to some, themselves to people uh, that have led um, large kind of multinational companies. So um, we're very lucky to have a really diverse but extremely strong board on, in Health and Her. Sherry, let me bring you in here. And, and, and when you're uh, looking to uh, recruit non-executive directors, what qualities do you look for and um, what should you be looking for? What, what, what's your advice? Sorry, was that, was that me? Yes, yeah, Sherry, yeah. Apologies, sorry. The, the, it was, um, so the qualities, I've got, I've got quite a long list down here. Um, I think first and foremost that they care deeply about what the company is trying to achieve. And it's important to, uh, to me, that's the most, that is probably the most important, although the others that I'm about to list are, are also important. But I think as an NED who has a very busy diary, I think that if you care about what the company is trying to achieve, you will be trying to help it achieve that in your sleep. It's like a Rubik's Cube or a puzzle that you're, that it's always on your mind and you know, wherever you are, you're trying to solve their problem. And, and I think that's only achieved if, if the person deeply cares about the company achieving its, its goals. So that's the number one for me. Um, uh, Kate, you mentioned um, experience and expertise. That is also really important because being able to understand what the company is trying to do it is very important as well. And I want to be able to onboard people quickly so that it's not a drag on my own productivity, tr productivity trying to explain to them what they do and that they don't take up, if I'm asking them to mentor or hoping they might mentor the senior team, that they don't take up all of that time just getting to grips with what the, what the company does and, and how it does it. So those are pretty important. Um, having time is really important. I have in the past um, recruited people who were the great and the good who didn't have time and they filled a seat and took a seat that I couldn't give to somebody else who, if they had time, would have been able to be more helpful to the company. So I'd be very wary of uh, checking that they also have the time, even if they are interested, because it can really damage, it, it, again, it can damage your ability to move forward and grow your company and solve problems if they're not reading the papers, they're not answering your calls or, or, or things like that. I mean, it's a terrible thing, um, but it does happen. Um, a really important one for those of us who are growing quickly is that they've experienced growth at a similar stage for the next stage that the company is, is about to go into. So, uh, and I think of that as scaffolding for the journey that a company is on. So you might start out with really small, but if you know you're going to move into a different country, you probably want someone who has helped another business move into several different countries or done product expansion, you know, either product or geographical, whatever your next journey is, you should make sure that you've you've got it on the on the board. Um, cultural fit is really important. If you have a square peg in a in a round hole, 
it can it can grate and it can slow things down and it can be quite stressful on the on the mental health of uh, of everybody. So I think the cultural fit is is important and and that's can you form a relationship? Is it a Boise Idaho test or is it do I want to be locked in a room or an elevator with this person for a long period of time? You know, would that be okay? And uh, again, that's very qualitative rather than quantitative. But you have to spend some time with people to make sure that that. You want to be around a table with them for nine years, and you should go into it thinking, "I'm going to be around a table with this person for nine nine years." Um, the mentoring mindset, I think, is really important. Do they consider themselves a, you know, mentor, and could they be a mentor for you or any number of people on your staff? Because the development of the senior leaders, you know, a yourself a CEO, but the senior leaders as well, that all takes time and it's quite complex. So. Are they the sort of person that is going to think of themselves as an educator? Sit down, help you, you know, plot out the the next chess moves that that you know that that any number of people need to need to make. I think those are probably the the, the ones that are uppermost in in my mind. Um, I definitely use a, a spreadsheet, uh, and I look at the you know it literally. I try to list down and also get other input from other people about. Where are our gaps? And if it were solely based on expertise, what would it be? I weight expertise um, and care about the company most. The others I give a slightly less weighting to, but they are all important. And all of those things I mentioned, they're literally columns on a spreadsheet. Uh, and then you've got the potential names that advisors, bankers, your friends, maybe headhunters will suggest to you. But in weighing it up, I, I, I find it helpful to put together a, a, a matrix just to to sort of try to line it up all at once. And then that allows you to get consensus and alignment among a number, number of other stakeholders who you also want to make sure you, you get soundings from. Sherry, I thought for a moment you were going to spill the beans on this great and good NED who uh, never showed up and uh, didn't have the time, but you glossed over it. But I'm going to have to uh, uh, press you tomorrow and uh, see if I can get a story on that. It sounds wonderful. Uh, I, let, let's just stay on recruitment and bring in Alison Thorne here. Uh, on recruitment and your thoughts. Um, I, I want to talk about diversity just as a last thought on this particular subject because it, it's a word that's thrown around constantly and a much discussed uh, subject when it comes to um, board recruitment. But it is important, it's absolutely critical. Yeah, and I think it's um, the definition for me is a diversity of thinking. I think all of the speakers have talked about that um, different uh, diversity and different perspective you get. Um, and, and so if you start to think about well, diversity of thinking, then you're looking to say from your recruitment, how can I be inclusive from the very beginning of that recruitment process? Um, and factually, McKinsey's report 2020 showed that those companies that had a well-balanced ethnicity and gender mix outperformed others in their sector by 25% on profit. So it's just not an emotional engagement, it's also a commercially minded engagement. Um, and I'm not going to say that it's easy. When you have diversity of thinking around a table or around a Zoom meeting, it's more challenging. But you get better decisions as a consequence and the business can then grow. So it's sort of planning to have that challenge and debate earlier and then you can grow as the organisation. And, uh, and I would also touch on, you know, the diversity of thinking you touch on age. So, you know, that's across age, that's about past, lived experiences. It's all of those elements. And I'm completely with Sherry in terms of skills audit. I do spreadsheets, skills audits, uh, completely around the skills, but also then what are the experiences you want to have? And, when, and if that helps people to think around, well, who's my customer? Does my board reflect my customer? Does my board reflect my shareholders and my stakeholders? And, and so it's ensuring there's true representation as well as the diversity of thinking. Let's go on next, if we may, to talk about uh, building effective boards. Let's talk, if, if we may, about best practice. Um, panelists, in your experience, how do you get uh, the best out of your boards? I mean, I'm interested to hear real life experiences here rather than generalities. Wayne, if I can begin with you, uh, your thoughts on this, building effective boards. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's quite a challenging skill to build up, uh, I have to say, um, but in the end, you want to go you want... right, and we're interested in your mistakes. It's, it's, it's juicy stuff, you know, come on. 
spill the beans. Yeah, I, 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 I guess that's right. Of course, I'm bound to say I've never made any mistakes at all, but um, I clearly answer, have. I, I think, I, I, yeah, I think the um, the first challenge when you're when you're a when you've built the board, but then you're working with the board is to make sure that you've got the right people in the right roles across the board, and um, that's quite difficult. As as we've heard, there there are approaches you can take with skills audits. But also, once they're on the board, you want to get the most out of them. Um, and you don't want to get into a culture of groupthink, which is you do see in some boards where everyone convinces themselves that collectively they've all made the right decision and they're doing the right things. So, I mean, an NED plays a big role in that. But uh, as a chair, you want to be able to get the, the board to work quite cohesively, but in a way with a culture of dissent. Um, and that's quite a big word, but I think it does help if you've got an open culture where people can potentially disagree with each other, um, whether it's on strategic decisions, recruitment decisions, whatever it may be, that will actually help the board to build um, a better skill set. You also need to refresh boards periodically and picking up Sherry's point um, about NEDs. I mean, NEDs do tend to be for three year appointments and very often they run for a further three and then a further three. But uh, I think there is some merit from time to time refreshing the board. Um, and also, if you look at uh, board performance and company performance, those boards that are regularly refreshed, and indeed even on the executive side where people are given different tasks and responsibilities over time, so that they don't always, for example, remain as operations director or whatever it may be, um, those companies do tend to perform better. So there is a need for, for some rigor uh, as a chair. Um, I think it does vary company by company. There is no um, you know, pro forma that you can apply to every, every single company. Um, and clearly public, you know, listed companies public, uh, on public markets will have a different board structure and a different focus to those in the private and in the public sector. But they do share the same core values. Um, and I think the other, the only other point I'd make is that I think it's very important to have a chair and a CEO who are from different backgrounds. Um, I think if if the chair and the CEO are both from the same segment, the same background, that doesn't necessarily bode well. Okay, um, Kate, let me bring you in here and let's stay on this. Uh, building effective boards and, and, and best practice, and in particular, your experience. Yeah, I mean, look, we're, you, you're bound to be making mistakes here. We, we've we definitely been in, in a position where we've wanted to refresh our board, and, and, and we, again, I know this matrix has been mentioned. I'd be happy to share an example of a matrix, actually, for, for those that are interested. Um, but we've also used that matrix to score how people are performing. Um, and and it, it actually, the other thing that is worth mentioning is we've also built our own personal board policy. So what, what exactly are we, are we wanting from our board? And, and really just writing it down really does help. And it's a great reference to come back to and, and, and to consistently assess how we're doing as a board. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to um, refresh completely. It could, it could just be a simple, um, work with the chair to to establish some further ground rules or or discuss performance as a group as well which which definitely has happened for us um and where where we would like uh you know it's, it's a feedback loop i suppose both ways really um the ceo often gets all the feedback but actually you know as a ceo it's also important to give our ned some feedback as well which i think is is useful um so i think yeah it's it's really accepting the fact that it's not going to be perfect. It's it's a it's a kind of continuous iteration, as, as is all businesses and all parts of business. Um, and I think that's really the best way to to approach it and and to get the best effectiveness from from the board uh, overall. Alison, thoughts from you on best practice and, and your experiences of the many organisations that you've been involved in. I think echoing some of the things that have been said, that the critical relationship is between the chair and the CEO. And it's getting that uh, dynamic right from both of those parties. And I think what aids that is when CEOs are open, open to support, open to uh, mentoring or advice from non-execs. So they create that open framework where NEDs feel they can contribute. Um, and uh, one of the best boards I've been on is when there are situations that have arisen, then the CEO and the exec will say, could we put a task and finish group together? 
where we bring the NEDs and the CEOs on to uh, and the executive to work on a particular issue. Uh, and, and that's a really good practice. Um, and for the non-execs to um, keep out of the detail, and I'm happy to admit a mistake, when I was first non-exec with a charity and uh, was asking questions around finance, was getting a bit frustrated, so I wrote the whole spreadsheet program for how it should be reported. I would never do that again, but it's an example of, you know, you want to help and you can sometimes overstep the mark as a non-exec. So I think it's being clear as a non-exec that you are there to guide, advise, scrutinize, not do, and that the chief exec and the executives are open to that support. Sherry, just a final thought on this about best practice and your experiences and how you get the best out of a board. Um, I think I agree with the points that are made by others. Uh, I'd say inviting exec directors to visit the board. Um, so not those that are on the board, but those that are working with the chief exec and finance finance director. I think there's a that develops these individuals so that they know the mysterious stuff that goes on at the board. Um, it also means that they can help create the papers that the board the board needs. Um, but for the board, it gives knowledge of the bench, uh, the, uh, the the strength behind or on the team of the of the, of the chief executive. And I think that's helpful so you can see, what is needed that you can bring from your network um, more more easily. Um, in terms of experience of abuse that I've done uh, to non-execs or felt as a non-exec, the timing of papers, I think giving your non-execs time to absorb the papers so that they can not have to think on their feet, but think and draw in and let you know, you know, let you know things is is really important. I know the rule of thumb is a week you know, week five days, I really think that that uh, you get the best if you can allow people to prepare for the meetings. Um, I think clarity, it hasn't been mentioned, but there's something called reserve matters. And it and this talks about what the board decides versus what the execs decide. And I think making sure that that is written, that you can get that from IOD or CBI, again, to, again, it, these rules are clear, but agreeing that means that there aren't misunderstandings between what the board thinks you should consult with them on and what you think you have freedom to, to make decisions on. And that that's important part of induction of a, of a, of a NED. Um, and uh, the final one that hurt, hurt me enormously about 20 years ago uh, was when an investor uh, negotiated the right, because they had put a huge amount of money into the into the company, to have uh, someone on the board, which is great. What I didn't know that time was that this would be a musical chair of somebody. I didn't say, you know, I said, oh sure, of course, you know, anybody, you're, you know, any friend of yours is a friend of mine, you know, utter naivety. Um, and they turned it into musical chairs of some new person that kept on showing up, who wasn't that interested in the business, didn't have time to do things. And it was really very, it created a caustic uh, atmosphere in the in the board because there were the people who did care and did show up and did prepare. And then there was this other person who was very powerful um, who didn't. So don't avoid that one, that's that's serious pain. And I've, I have successfully avoided it for the last 18 years, but I fell into that trap uh, and I still, I still have pain. Uh, I, I still have pain from from that. Uh, so, uh, and again, it's reasonable for someone to ask, but it's not unreasonable for you to say you want to be part of the process that goes through. And if they turn out to be a tissue action sort of situation, you reserve the right to ask for somebody else within their organization to represent their interests that that doesn't cause this this friction. And that. That those are difficult conversations to have, and it's a conversation for your chair to have, but it's important to give yourself that breathing space in, in case you find out someone uh, who isn't really making a contribution can be can be removed um, and easily without trauma. Well, just as we were getting to the nitty gritty, and I sense you're about to name and shame all these people, we have to wrap it up. Uh, Sherry, um, thank you uh, for that. And thanks to all our panelists uh, in this session. Uh, you've been listening to uh, Wayne Harvey, uh, Sherry Kusu, uh, Kate Bash, and Alison Thorne. Thanks to all of you for your uh, contributions uh, and your expertise.